Shout out to these people for today's video suggestion. Hello everyone. Sorry that it has taken me five months to upload again. I've been a bit busy with a lot of schoolwork, but now that it's summer, I plan to upload a lot more. And I do want to say thank you all for the support this channel's gotten. Despite my inactivity, we've climbed up to 300 subscribers since I started my advanced movement system tutorial, which has over 1300 views, which I'm eternally grateful for. As for this, I'm gonna try stepping up the quality of my videos from now on. I have a lot more tutorials planned in the future, such as a remastered version of the advanced movement system in R6, which will all be combined into a single video, or at least I'll try to. An RPG character creator tutorial, a drag and drop inventory system, a lock on system, and much, much more. Let me know which kind of tutorials you'd like me to make. Feel free to suggest them down in the comments below as you could be featured in the next video. Anyways, let's get started with this tutorial. This wall climb is partly based on the one that's used in Deep Broken. Our wall climb will be categorically broken down into three main mechanics. The wall climb itself, the ledge grabbing, and then the ledge venting. Open up a fresh place in studios, let's save the game, name it whatever. For my wall climb system, it will be in R6. I'm also going to disable shift lock by going to starter player, then disabling the mouse lock option. I'm doing this because the default shift lock kind of messes with our scripting logic later on. Before this tutorial starts, I'd strongly recommend getting this YouTube pop-up extension link in the description. I'm not sponsored or anything, it's just going to make the tutorial much easier to follow along. Rather than you flicking back and forth between tabs, you can pop the video player out and it'll always be on top of other tabs making it easier to pause, play and follow along. Let's make some actual walls to climb on. In the link in the description, there will be a package of everything I use in the tutorial, including the animations and sound effects. Put these two folders in their respective locations and then ungroup them. We're going to use them later. What I like to do in a lot of my videos is name the template as starter character and place them under starter player. Remember to unanchor their humanoid root parts, that way you can actually move around. When our template is named starter character and they're placed under starter player, this will automatically instantiate our character as the dummy. This will guarantee our character to spawn in R6. Now let's create two walls here using this cube. Set their size to 20, 30, 20 for each of them respectively. We're gonna insert an attribute into both of these walls. Name it climbable and set it to boolean. Set this one to true and set the other one as false. This will determine whether the wall is climbable or not, so if you want to, you can make some walls in your game non-climbable. You can name these walls whatever you want, it won't matter. My package contains three folders. The only one we're going to be using is the VFX sound, but when it comes to game development, these are the only three types of sound you'd ever actually use, and it's important to stay organized this way. Insert a local script under starter player scripts. I named mine master client, but you can name it whatever you want. Here, we're just going to add some of our basic player variables and services, which we will use later. Go back and drag our starter character back to the workspace, and you'll see three animations that I created in R6. You can export them as your own by right-clicking, pressing save slash export, then save to Roblox. Name them respectively and save them, and make sure to copy these IDs and store them somewhere safe. We're going to be using them later. I like to store my IDs in the output log as they're easy to access later. We're going to create a folder in replicate storage called assets. Create another folder called animations, and then we'll create another folder inside, which we're going to call wall climb anims. Then we're going to place our animation objects inside these. Create three of them. Name them, then place the IDs in them. Our wall climb needs to meet a few conditions before it occurs. The player must be holding W and must be close to the wall. The player must be airborne, which they can do by jumping or falling, and then the player must press space. If a player presses space whilst all three of these conditions are met, and the wall climb will happen. Let's start with a difficult part, which is detecting the player's proximity to a wall. We're going to be using an inbuilt Roblox feature called ray casting. It's kind of like shooting an invisible laser beam from the player's torso. We use two variables, a position vector and the direction vector, which is just the player's look vector multiplied by a constant. Before we can create the ray cast itself, we have to create something called the ray casting params, which essentially just manages the behavior of the ray casting. When we set filter type to exclude, we will ignore detecting any instance inside of this table. If you set the filter type to include, it will only look to detect any instances inside of this table. We're going to set to exclude for now because we don't want to constantly detect our own character. We're going to place our raycast under the heartbeat event listener, which fires after physics calculations are rendered every frame. This will constantly refresh our raycast as it constantly looks and sets it to the new position and look vector of a humanoid root part. Our result variable represents any instance that's currently in front of the player. We can check if this instance has the wall climbing attribute. If result is true, then it means there's a wall currently in front of our character. We'll create a boolean value called canClimb, 
and this will keep track of whether the wall in front of us is climbable or not. The else statement just means there's nothing in front of the player, so it's just air. We're also going to create a variable called last climbable state, which will store the wall instance as a variable, so we can keep track of exactly what wall the player is currently looking at. Let's add these print statements to check if it's working. We'll make it check for the last climbable state, and only print if that variable changes. Let's drag our starter character back under start player, and let's give it a quick playtest. As you can see, the print statement completely ignores the wall, which has its climbable attribute set to false. On the other hand, the player can detect that this wall is climbable, but if we take a step back, we can see that our code knows that we're no longer near the wall. Now that the hard bit is done, let's check if the player is holding W. Create an empty table called keys held. This table will be used as a dictionary to keep track of what keys are currently being pressed. Scroll down, then use the user input service to set up an input began event listener. Input began has two inbuilt parameters, input and game processed event. Game process event is actually interesting because it's a boolean value. This variable becomes true when the player is using a Roblox core GUI, such as the main menu or typing. If we try printing out our game processed event, you can see it constantly prints out true whenever I type anything in the chat. This is good because it allows us to detect and ignore input actions whenever the player is typing. We can do this by writing if GPS, then return end. The main thing we care about here is the input itself, as we can check if it's equal to any specific input keys. Input keys are Roblox specific data types, so we have to check if they're equal to enum.keycode.w rather than w as a string itself. Now this runs whenever the player presses w. If that's true, we'll set keyshold.w to true. We also need to create an event listener for when the player lets go of a key. Luckily this exists as an input ended event listener, and then set keyshold.w to false. Now we're going to check if the player is airborne. This is surprisingly straightforward as Roblox has a way to track this as well, using something called humanoid state types. This exists in the form of an event listener, called state changed. This event listener has two built-in parameters, old state and new state. We don't really care about old state, so we're going to leave that as an underscore to not confuse us. We're going to check if our new state is equal to freefall or jumping, because both cases means the player is airborne. We're also going to create another variable called isInAir to track whether the player is in the air or not, which we will set to false whenever the player lands on the ground. We're also going to create another variable called grounded, and this is an important variable because it will allow the player to reset their climb once they've touched the ground, preventing them from spamming it. This is a mistake I made in the code. Grounded should initially be set to true as the player spawns in while touching the ground. Now let's create the wall climbing logic itself. We'll create a function for it to make it nice and easy to keep track of and change the logic later. This part right here is a mistake. Ignore this line as we're going to check for this line after the player makes the input first. We're going to create another variable called isClimbing Set that to false, and this will simply keep track of whether the player is currently climbing or not. When the player begins climbing, we're going to set grounded to false, and is climbing to true. We're going to reference our wall climb animation and ledge grab animation up here. The third animation will be used on the server, so don't worry about that for now. Now, we're going to play the wall climb animation. We're going to create a new folder up here and name it events. We're going to add a remote event here and name it sound event. We're going to use this to play sound on the server later. Create a variable for the sound event instance. We don't need to use WaferChild for the assets folder again, as it's already been loaded up here. But we'll still use WaferChild for the events folder and sound events instance to make sure they're loaded, as this is the first time they're being referenced. Added another service called sound service, and when we fire the sound event, we're going to pass in the instance of the sound effect we want played on the server. For this, it'll just be the climbing sound. Now we're going to create a body velocity which will momentarily launch the player upwards. Add a debris service. All this does is destroy our body velocity instance in 0.3 seconds. I decided to make the velocity decay a variable outside of a function, so it's easier to change. Just adding a few notes here to remember what each thing does. Remember, staying organized is key, as it makes the code much easier to understand and change later. I added a variable called max climb height outside of the function, which actually controls the climbing speed, not the height, so I recommend naming it climb speed. I use the task.delay function simply because I want the climb sound effect to play twice. And the second one just sets the is climbing variable back to false. Make this number as 1 rather than 0.4 seconds, as you won't be able to grab ledges, as this time window is too short. This is a mistake I made which I end up correcting later. So now we check for the logic. This is another really big mistake I make, which I actually don't end up correcting. We want to make sure the input is equal to space first before checking these variables. Otherwise the climb can be initiated with any key such as E or H, which we don't want. Here's what the corrected version of the code looks like. Again, sorry for this massive oversight. And now here, I just did a bit of playtesting, and this is the part where I actually realized I checked for the same logic twice. So I removed that line, and now the wall climbing works. I noticed the detection range from the wall was too large, so I turned it into a variable outside the code, and changed it from the number 10 to 1. 
and then I set grounded to true. Now we're going to make the server sided logic. Insert a script under server script service, and I'm going to name this master service. First thing I'm going to do is code the event listener for the sound and make sure it's played. We're going to reference the sound event up here. Server sided event listeners have the first parameter as the player who fired them. That's how the server identifies which player to interact with. And of course, the second parameter is just the sound instance we passed in from the client. We're going to clone the sound instance, parent it to the player's root part, and then play it from there. Then we're going to use the pre service to destroy the sound two seconds later. And yeah, that's the sound logic done encoded. Now we're going to make the grabbable ledges. Create a folder under workspace and name it assets. Create another folder called ledges. Inside of here, we're going to create our grabbable ledges. We're going to insert a part, set its size to 111. And now, very importantly, we need to make sure our part is facing away from the wall. How can we tell which way the part is facing? Well, a handy trick I learned is to place a decal under the part. This decal will reveal the front face of our part. Now we can rotate it to face away from our ledge. I'm gonna set its transparency to 0.5 and set it to another color. Now make sure the ledge fully covers the top of the wall. Now we can make as many of these as we want and place them wherever. Also make sure anchored is set to true and can collide is set to false so the ledges don't fall off. We're going to go back to our client script. Use task.wait3 to wait a few seconds for the ledges to fully load in. We're going to reference our ledges folder and loop through it to set up the dot touched event for all the ledges under the folder. We're going to create two new variables, a ledge grab cooldown, which just lets us know if we can grab the ledge or not, and is grabbing ledge, which will track whether the player is currently holding onto a ledge. Now, our ledge can only be grabbed if the player climbs using our is climbing logic to track it. Now, let's create the ledge grab event under our events folder. Going to create a new variable to reference this event. Again, we don't need to wait for the events folder to load because it's already been loaded here. And then we're going to fire the ledge grab event and we're going to pass in the exact wall we're climbing. I'm going to create a new variable called ledge grab cooldown number. Yeah, I'm not the best at naming things. This cooldown will just be how long we have to wait until we can grab another ledge. The reason for the cooldowns is to prevent us from constantly grabbing the ledge over and over when we try and vent over it. Now, we're going to code the ledge grab logic on the server side. And this is arguably the trickiest part of the tutorial here. We're going to reference the ledge grab event up here. We're going to get the player's character, humanoid, and root part. First, we're going to anchor the player so they can't move. And here, we're going to declare a variable called y offset, which will allow you to modify how high or low you would want the player to be from the ledge. Add another variable which will control how far they will be from the ledge. You can play around with these two variables and change their numbers however you like. But I'm going to keep these two numbers as we work the best for me. We're going to declare the ledge's look vector to know where the ledge is facing. The horizontal ledge forward variable just removes the y vertical component of the direction because we only care about horizontal movement on the xz plane. Dot unit just normalizes the vector so it represents direction not distance. Offset position just removes the player towards the ledge by going the opposite of the ledge's forward facing direction. And the look variable just makes the player face towards the ledge basically. This was a bit tricky to figure out when I first coded it which is why this tutorial took me about 4 attempts to make because the previous iterations had a few issues with them. Now we're going to reference the player's ledge grab animation, which by the way, if you made your own animation, for this it should be a single frame and the looping should be set to true before exporting it. We're going to give this a quick playtest, and it works, woohoo! The reason why this works really well is because it doesn't matter which way the ledges face, the player will always grab and face the direction of the ledge, which allows you to place from anywhere and customize your map however you like. Now we need to make it so the player can release from the ledge. Create your third and final remote event called release ledge event. Go back to our local script and reference it here. Now, I'm going to make two ways for the player to release from the ledge. Pressing S or pressing space. Check if the player is currently grabbing the ledge. If they are, then we can fire the event and set is grabbing ledge to false. We're also going to pass in a boolean parameter, false. And this is important because the server will receive this value and if it's false, the player will gently release from the ledge. If it's true, then the player will just vent over it. Just adding some comments so I can remember that. Going to quickly copy and paste the ledge grab event line from the client to the server. Now let's code the event listener. Set these values for our player here. Another small mistake I made here. This should be not root part or else the code isn't going to work at all. Now we're going to use a loop to stop our ledge grab single frame animation. And now we're going to check if vault is false via this else statement in which we'll simply set the root part anchoring to false. Now if the player presses S we can release the ledge smoothly now. This is a mistake I made in my code where my is climbing variable becomes false too quickly. I already pointed out the issue before so yours is corrected already. I end up fixing this later so don't worry too much about it. We can remove this line because it's kind of redundant. This is me changing it back to one second. 
Also make sure to set is climbing to false when the player grabs the ledge, as when the player gets anchored, all physics calculations stop for the player, which also in turn cancels their body velocity. It's fixed. Now we're going to create the vaulting, which is super straightforward. I just moved the spawn location closer so it's easier to playtest. Go back to our local script and check if the player presses space. Then check if they are grabbing a ledge. If they are, then fire the remote event, this time passing the value true instead of false. And then setting is grabbing ledge back to false. Go to our server script. We're going to play our vaulting animation here and reference for our animation object up here. And then we can load it into our humanoid. Unanchor the root part. Now we're going to create another body velocity to gently nudge the player upwards and forwards. Tiny mistake I made here. Line should look like this. I end up correcting it later. Max force just needs to be a vector of large numbers in it. I just set mine to 4000. Velocity.p just refers to the power, I set it to 1250. Parent the velocity to the player's root part so it pushes them. Use debris to destroy it after 0.3 seconds. We can create a sound effect on the server and add a debris to it at 1.5 seconds. And now we're done. There are sound effects, my recorder just didn't pick up for this clip. Anyways, thank you for watching and I'll see you again on the next tutorial.